If you're looking for a compact, fast focal ratio, wide field astrophotography telescope, the William Optics MiniCat 51 might be on your radar. But how does it actually perform? Is it worth the investment? Today, I'm putting it to the test, covering its design, optics, and real world performance under the stars. Also, I'm going to weigh in on the controversy surrounding this telescope. It is perhaps the biggest marketing debacle of the year. And boy, do I have some thoughts about it. Welcome to Rob Observatory. Hi, I'm Rob Lyons, and we're at the Kitsilano Observatory taking a look at the William Optics MiniCat 51, which is the widest offering to date in the much-loved RedCat lineup of telescopes. I mentioned controversy involving this telescope, and there certainly is, but let's give it a good once-over first, and then we can get to the juicy stuff. The MiniCat 51 comes with a nice little carrying case, the telescope itself, a quality control test sheet, and a multi-hex tool. And that's about all there is in the box. Looking at the telescope itself, it is a 51 millimeter aperture with a focal length of 178 millimeters, which results in a focal ratio of f3.5. It's a six element Petzval design, which does not have a specific back focus requirement. It features FPL 53 and 51 glass with synthetic fluorite, and two of the six elements are ED, or extra low dispersion glass, containing lanthanum to improve contrast and sharpness, while controlling chromatic aberration. This is good glass. It's built like a tank with a CNC machined aluminum body, and it comes in classic William Optic style, premium finish, solid construction, and that signature Batnoff mask built right into the lens cap. It is lightweight at around 2.3 kilograms or five pounds, making it an excellent option for travel on a small mount or even piggybacking it on a larger scope. You'd be hard pressed to find nicer finishing and design than William Optics. They make beautiful telescopes and this one is no exception. Looking at the back of the telescope, it comes with a manual rotator to adjust your camera angle. It has an adapter installed with M48 threads, and it can be unscrewed to reveal an M54 connection underneath. Speaking of revealing, we can remove the plate at the back to expose the hex screws that enable a built-in tilt adjustment, which is very handy if your camera didn't come with one or you've removed it. We have a saddle up top for mounting a guide scope or accessories, and some tapped holes on the side of the mounting ring for additional accessories. It comes stock with a dual speed focuser with absolutely buttery smooth movement. The focuser can accept external electronic focusers without issue or additional adapters. On the opposite side, we see a thermometer, which I found kind of silly at first, but I kind of sort of maybe get it. This could be handy if you're shooting with a mirrorless camera and you want to make note of the temperature to shoot matching dark frames, or if you want to monitor the temperature and refocus it if it changes too much. This is the only way I can imagine myself using it, but if you have other ideas, let me know. Let's backtrack to that focuser for just a second. This system is what William Optics calls the WIFD, William's Internal Focus Design. And I have to be blunt and ask the question, is this actually internal focus? Because to me, an internal focus design would happen inside the telescope. And at first glance, that's the case here. But if you remove the dew shield, you'll see that the telescope actually trombones out. And this is typically defined as lens extension or external focus, not internal focusing. You will notice that the lens length increases and decreases when you're focusing. And that is the definition of external focus. It's clever to hide it behind the dew shield. And for all intents and purposes, it works great. It's a small gripe, but to me, this does not meet the definition of internal focusing. And calling that, it's really pushing the boundaries of marketing, but it is a welcome improvement over the previous helical focusers that we saw in the older Red Cat design. The MiniCat 51 is designed to reduce chromatic aberration and deliver sharp, well-corrected images across the field. I said designed to, but unfortunately, it doesn't do that. And here is where the controversy lies. Let's have a quick story time with Rob. I first saw this scope when it was announced for pre-sale on Facebook. I was excited at the focal length and the focal ratio. Being an owner and a fan of the original Red Cat 51, I went ahead and pre-ordered the scope on the spot. 
And at the time, there was no page built on the William Optics website for this telescope, just a couple of Facebook posts and a couple of pre-sale pages on retailers' websites. So the scope finally gets released, it ships to me, and sadly, it sits on a shelf inside for months due to the horrible winter weather that we had this year. So what was the source of all this controversy? The Minicat 51 product page finally went live. And that page explains that while it supports full frame, only APS-C is recommended. And on top of that, they suggest to use Blur Exterminator to improve the less than stellar, stellar performance in the corners. And all of this was starting to make me feel a little bit sick because my scope was now out of the return window. And at this point, I should probably let you know that I had purchased an ASI 6200 MC Pro to pair it with for ultra wide field imaging. And that was based on the fact that they showed the scope being used with a full frame sensor in these Facebook posts that I originally saw when I purchased the telescope. And I would not have bought this telescope and a full frame camera if I had this information up front. But here I am. Now, the story doesn't end here because the skies at some point eventually cleared up and I managed to get first light. And guess what? It didn't suck at all. In fact, it was pretty awesome. It was exactly what I had imagined when I ordered it. Super wide field imaging and I was ecstatic. This is why we need to be careful about what we read and watch on the internet. Let's look at the actual performance of the scope and discuss optics in general, shall we? For reference, here is my first light image. I love it. There's so much going on in that gigantic wide field image, so much to explore. It's incredible. And that size is uh, something that I want to touch on and make the first point about performance of this telescope. The stars are not great in the corners, and they're actually not great quite a ways into the frame. And the important note here is that it is such a wide field, and the stars are so tiny within that field that you have to zoom into ridiculous levels to even see their true shape. You have to pixel peep the heck out of it. So here's a close up of the stars in the corner. Lots of coma. Not as bad as the online chatter prepared me for, but it's there. Now, William Optics suggests using Blur Exterminator to clean it up. They also suggest using an APS-C sensor. So I was a little bit worried about what was gonna happen because I'm on a full frame. So does it work? It sure does. Sharpens them up nicely and makes them reasonably round. My corners on the full frame sensor look about the same as others do on APS-C. So performance drops off just before the corners of APS-C. And uh, it actually comes in a little ways. I've seen kind of bad stars in the corner of 533s as well, but it doesn't seem to get much worse as you go out in the frame like you would probably suspect it would. Usually things get worse and worse and worse as you get to the corners. But basically once you hit APS-C, it stays the same out to the edges from there. Now I often say it doesn't matter how you get to Vegas, and that is true here too. The Minicat gets you most of the way and Blur X handles the last stretch. I completely understand that that is unacceptable to some people. They pay for what they consider to be a premium price and expect premium results, which they aren't seeing here. But is that true? I challenge you to name a scope in this focal length and ratio that performs better. Go ahead. Oh wait, there really aren't any. And there is a reason why there are about 10 million 250 millimeter focal length telescopes at F5 on the market. And that's because you can fairly easily make a well-corrected scope at that focal length and focal ratio. If you wanna go wider or faster or faster and wider, then all that goes out the window and things start getting very difficult. I own a ton of camera lenses that cost more than double what this scope does and they don't produce great corner stars either, and you have to stop them down quite a bit to get that performance. To get perfect stars in the corners out to a full frame sensor on a telescope is an engineering challenge. This scope is a compromise. It's wide, it's fast, but it suffers from some coma, astigmatism, and vignetting on larger sensors, but not so much that it can't be corrected to produce incredible images. 
This is not a premium price for a telescope. A premium price would be triple the cost, and it would probably offer some improvement on performance as well, but the market would be a lot smaller, and believe me, the telescope would be a lot bigger. In my opinion, this scope has a reasonable price to performance ratio. Okay, before we wrap up, let's take a look at a couple more images. I mentioned earlier that I would not have bought this telescope if I had seen the website and all the online discussion beforehand. But I am so glad I did buy this telescope. And in the process of all this, I've learned that you have to be very careful who you listen to online. That includes me as well, by the way. There's no replacement for first-hand experience or at least pretty high quality second-hand experience or information. Now, this really is a marketing debacle on the part of William Optics. They were honest and that's brave. I wanna give them credit for that. However, the way they went about it, the release, and then putting the information up after, that didn't really land well with people, including myself, and it created some controversy, and it has been a wild ride. So to conclude, this is a compact, wide field, fastish focal ratio telescope that has some coma issues in the corner, even when using a smaller or mid-sized sensor camera. But those stars are so tiny in the frame that unless you print a massive large poster, they'd be pretty hard to notice. And a little blur exterminator will handle that with no problem. I think it's priced pretty fairly given its build and performance, but others don't necessarily agree with that. And for that reason, I'm not gonna recommend or not recommend this telescope. I'll just provide you with my experience using it. You're gonna have to weigh in and make your own decision based on your own personal criteria surrounding what an optic should and shouldn't be and how much that should cost. So I've shared my thoughts about it. I love the images I've made so far with mine and I'm looking forward to making tons more in the future. I'd also like to know what you think about this scope and all the marketing debacle surrounding it. Drop me a comment below and we'll continue the conversation. And until next time, my friends, carpe noctum.